welcome to another hour of Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we're glad you could join us tonight as we answer all those garden questions. You can give us a call at 1-800-676-5446 as our master gardeners are standing by to help us help you with your questions. If you would like to submit a question or a picture for a future show, please send us an email to byf at unl.edu. We do need to know where you live and give us as much information as you can so that we can help you with that question. Do make sure you subscribe to and follow us on our social media channels, YouTube and Facebook. So let's start with samples. Kyle, you admitted that you killed your sample, but you can still talk about it, right? Yeah, unfortunately I didn't like uh, the, the conditions I kept it in, so it's no longer alive, but um, I brought in something that I, I get a, a handful of questions about. Um, usually this time of year, late summer or fall, um, people will email wondering if they've discovered some new mutant insect or something. Um, unfortunately, you haven't. Uh, this is a mole cricket. So these are really cool um, crickets that are basically specialized for burrowing uh, into soil. Um, they have these highly modified front legs, fossorial front legs that they use for, for digging. Um, and they do kind of look a, a little bit like a, a cross between a mole and a cricket. Um, this is a northern mole cricket, so these are, are native to uh, eastern North America. And um, the only species we really have here in Nebraska, they're not really a pest of anything. It's mostly just a, a kind of a curiosity if you find them. They're, they're rarely a pest in turf grass. In the south, there are a few species that can become uh, turf grass pests. Um, they tunnel underneath the, the grass and they'll feed on those roots. Um, and that tunneling can create problems occasionally, but, but really it's just kind of an interesting thing that if, if you find, um, just enjoy it, but nothing to be concerned about. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, Dennis. Okay, so what I brought here, this is a decays brown snake, and it's named after a famous herpetologist, and this is full grown. So this snake, this is a female, and not only is she full grown, but she's gravid, she's gonna have live young probably within a week. She's a little late. And this is a 100% harmless snake, and its favorite food is slugs. And you can see that small little head. Lots of times it'll put its head in land snails and suck out the little slug or snail, because that's their favorite food. They'll also eat small, tiny little earthworms. But they're great to have in the garden, especially if you have hostas. They'll take care of the slugs and snails around the hostas. Um, and again, sometimes they're darker. Sometimes they have bl blacker lines. They have a white belly. And they like it when it's cooler and wet. And they're found in the eastern part of the state. So they are a native snake. What is they her name? They are native. What's her name? Storaria decay. <laughs> <laughs> hard, hard to roll off the tongue. Storaria decay. And a very natural pesticide. Yep. Awesome. That, she's pretty. Yeah, she is. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Mm -hmm. We're glad Lauren isn't sitting next to you because he'd be in your lap. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'd be in Sarah's, Sarah's lap. lap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sarah, beautiful also. What is that? Yes. So um, these flowers came from uh, one of our colleagues, retired now, uh, agronomist Keith Gluen. This is a sweet, um, sweet pepper bush, uh, Clethra ulnifolia. This happens to be a cultivar called a ruby spice and blooming right now and very, very pretty. So this is a woody shrub. Uh, it likes to grow in, um, it can grow in full shade, but it would probably do best in about partial shade uh, to partial sun. And they do like moisture soil. So if you have an area in your landscape where the soil tends to stay a little bit wet, this would be a great um, shrub to put in that location. In fact, uh, you'll probably get a little bit of leaf burning or something like that if they were in soil that was too dry. Uh, they um, get to be about four to six feet tall and um, uh, a, a similar width, somewhere in that, that same area for width. So um, sweet pepper bush, and this is the cultivar ruby spice. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's a, a really pretty one to think about adding to a landscape. And beautiful for scent and for butterflies. Definitely great for butterflies, yeah. Excellent, mm -hmm. thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. All right, you're up, Kyle. Your first one is the first one we've gotten this season of this particular insect. This comes to us from Gibbon, and uh, she described it as worm sacs on a spreading cedar. What is it? Yeah, it's, she's right. They're uh, bagworms. 
So, yeah, fortunately, um, the really harsh winter really did seem to, uh, that, that harsh cold we had there for a week or so really seemed to, to kill uh, a lot of the bagworm eggs. So we, we have not seen the numbers like normal. Um, with bagworms, you know, you have to really, um, those eggs hatch in, in June, usually about the start of June, and you're really looking to treat for those in that time period in, in June before July. Once you get to August, they're getting fairly mature, you can't treat for them, but hopefully because of the harsh winter, you know, you're not seeing too many, you can just hand pick those, um, you know, pick them through the fall and winter before the, those eggs would hatch next spring and, and make sure you destroy the bags. Excellent. Throw them on the concrete and let the birds have them. Sure, yeah. Perfect. All right, your next one uh, comes to us from Omaha. She has a maple, has these fuzzy white bugs every other year, it seems. Um, she has, she's tried a tree service to spray. She's tried to spray with a hose, but they come back almost immediately. She's wondering what she can do to get rid of them herself. Yeah, you know, these are woolly aphids. Mm -hmm. um, they. There's a few different species which will will feed on, on maples. One will overwinter there, the way she kind of sees them every few years, maybe that's what's going on here. But they're really not gonna harm anything, um, especially that you know at that density, they're not gonna hurt the tree. So I would just sort of keep spraying, and it might be something you have to do regularly, spraying with the hose once a week or a little bit more, but I, I definitely wouldn't, wouldn't invest in uh, a pest control company for these. Um, if, if you know you are wanting to do something, you could try an insecticidal soap. That's usually pretty good for for aphids. But beyond that, I just spray them with All water. Right. Excellent. All right. So here we go with magnolia. This one came from a Lincoln viewer, and she sent multiple pictures, all of which looked like this. She has used eight and a couple of other insecticides, and then of course you've got the honeydew. So what do we have going on here? Yep, magnolia scale. This is one of the largest uh, largest scales we have, really conspicuous. Um, and so yeah, you used the, she was treating with an insecticide, but um, really the key for these is timing. Like with any scale, you have to get those crawlers. And so the crawlers are just actually, they'll be emerging now through August. Um, and the best time to treat those is just after those crawlers are actually uh, settling. So you can use a horticultural oil um, for, for the, the crawlers after they've settled. That would be like the, the end of August, beginning of September. Um, these magnolia scale can actually be pretty problematic, more so than most of our scales. They, they can uh, really cause dieback and you know, with sustained issues can even kill the tree. So that, that's one that you can maybe be a little bit more aggressive with treating and you can use a systemic uh, like a midocloprid and that you could apply as a soil drench either in the uh, like late summer, fall, around now, um, or you could do it in the spring, um, but you would wanna make sure you do it after, after the trees have, have flowered in the spring. All right, thank you, Kyle. All right, Dennis, uh, your first one comes to us from a Donovan viewer and his cabbages have been gnawed on. Somebody was hungry and he's wondering, is this insects or is this a critter? It, this looks more like a critter, the amount that's taken, and it can be anything. Um, a rabbit would do that, but also a woodchuck would love to do it. <laughs> um, they are as far west as Donovan, um, and actually almost far, as far west as Kearney, the woodchucks right now. So, um, but it's definitely a, you know, a herbaceous, uh, thing like a rabbit or a woodchuck, probably one of the two. I wouldn't think it's a raccoon. No, no teeth marks aren't for a raccoon, so it's going to be um, either a rabbit or a woodchuck. All right, so fencing, right? Fencing, yep. yep. All right. Your next one is a uh, La Vista viewer. He stopped growing sweet corn because the varmints can always tell when it's perfectly right. He switched to popcorn, and last year they cracked that code too. <laughs> so he said, and he's showing us a picture, they bite the stalk off about eight to 10 inches off the ground, then they pull down the stalk and eat the corn. He's wondering how to deter them. Okay, this is likely raccoons. Um, electric fence, if you're in an area where you can use electric fence, and of course, you, what you do, you can only have, you can do it with one strand, uh, have it, electrified and have aluminum foil every three foot or every meter. They will come up and they'll, about two foot high, 
They'll put their nose to that because of the peanut butter and the aluminum foil hanging there, and that will send them back a rolling. Um, yeah, it's not going to kill them, but they, the most sensitive part of their body is their nose, and they want to smell that peanut butter. And so if you just put one high tensile wire around the whole thing, about three foot out, and put an aluminum foil tent with peanut butter every three foot. And you can do that in town? No. Right, that's... It's good. where you can have electric fence. Yeah, yeah, yeah what, so he won't be able to do for it. for some reason, toddlers like peanut butter too, and <laughs> they don't want, let us do that to toddlers. All right. So your next one is also a, uh, a raccoon question. This, uh, she has a young raccoon who uh, has been doing this to all of her house plants on the porch, and she saw the raccoon. She did try red pepper flakes, but that didn't seem to deter her this guy. Yeah, raccoons aren't related to her by, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're from South America. They like hot food, <laughs> um, but uh, originally from South America. Um, yeah, it, I would say you're going to have to put a fence around it or fence off the whole area. They're not after that as a food product, so it's not what you're picking. Uh, it's just mainly they're playing around or they may be looking for a place to, for latrine. Mm. to dig and do their defecation. Mm. So. That's worse yet. Yeah. All right. Your next one is uh, a maple. He sent several pictures, but this is the one that tells the tale. Uh, growing pile of the strips of debris around the base. It's got a hole about two inches around. He's seen baby squirrels in the area of the knot and hasn't seen the debris, you know, the strips of, of bark until lately. So is this a likely squirrel nest, squirrel yeah. in a hole. Yeah, the squirrels, they're having their second litter. They're just getting on their own right now. So the second litter, and I would say it's definitely a squirrel. It'd be a perfect place for a squirrel. Yeah, so any method of? You can trap the squirrel, um, and, then, and then you kind of haze it when it's in the trap, um, what, especially if they're smaller ones, just squirrel with water, and then release them in the exact same place, and they'll associate that area with, um, you know, being hazed. You could wait and to make sure they're out of there by maybe putting water in that hole after they're old enough. Mm -hmm. And then you don't want to, you know, patch the hole so it heals properly, but maybe just tack some quarter inch mesh over the hole temporarily. So it doesn't hurt the tree, but it allows the tree to heal, but yet they can't go in and out of that hole. All right, thank you, Dennis. And your final one is a Stromsburg viewer, and we had another uh, picture from another viewer from Omaha mm -hmm. that looked exactly like this. Yeah, this is a young raccoon who likes mulberries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. Yep. All right, so, thank you. Uh, raccoon night. Mm -hmm. All right, Sarah, uh, you have tree night, I think, tonight. Okay. Your first one, uh, this is a 40-year-old butternut, which is lovely, but it has a lot of dead branches in it. Um, he's wondering whether this is a result of the winter injury or is this tree kind of on its last legs? And you can kind of see the form of the tree as it comes down to the main trunk there too. Yeah, I, I don't think this is winter injury at all. I think it looks like there's a large wound on the base of the trunk and there's probably some significant wood rot in that trunk. Um, and those branches that above that are dying are, are probably attached to that area where the bark has uh, died. So um, no, I don't think it's winter injury at all, but is the tree on its way out? Maybe. Um, it looks like it's kind of standing out in the open, so there may not be a lot of targets if, if branches were to fall. Um, so it, it may be a little bit lower risk from that standpoint, but, but that's a pretty significant wound on the trunk. And I, I'm thinking that there's probably also a pretty large amount of rot in the center of that trunk. So um, it's, prob it's not going to be a long-term tree. It might be a tree that you want to start thinking about replacing and putting in something new. All right, thanks, Sarah. Your next three pictures are uh, a maple in Omaha. And the, the description is sort of these strange, chalky, dark areas at the base. Last year, they weren't quite this bad. This year, they look like this. It's 30 years old, but it's also dropping huge amount of uh, of helicopters, and this is kind of the structural form of this tree. What, what do we think? Well, the helicopters are normal. I mean, there's really nothing out of the ordinary about that. Um, 
The, the black chalky structures at the base of the trunk, I have to admit, honestly, I'm not sure what that is. Um, my first thought when I looked at that was wet wood infections, but typically wet wood infections aren't, aren't as dark, as intensely dark colored as that. Um, structurally, the tree is a little questionable because you've got several co-dominant co trunks that all originate from the same uh, location on the trunk which makes them you know, weakly attached to each other and, and the tree likely to split at that point at, at some point in the future. But those are, unfortunately, that's just kind of a, a, a factor of a fast growing maple that they are prone to co-dominant leaders. So um, I would consult with a, a professional arborist in your area, have them come out and take a look at the tree. They can inspect it a lot more closely than I can from these pictures and give you a recommendation on, on what they think should be done. All right, thanks, Sarah. And your final one here is, uh, it's only a 10-year-old bur oak, and apparently uh, an, an ash fell on it, and they were careful removing the, the limb, but the main leader is sort of doing this lean thing. Mm -hmm. He's wondering whether he needs to do anything to straighten it. Will it straighten itself? What do you, what do you think on this one? Well, there's probably internal cracks in that wood. Um, that, that occurred when the branch fell on it. So um, those, those, if there are internal cracks, they're not gonna heal themselves. They're not gonna you know, grow back together or anything like that. Um, I guess if, if it were my tree, what I probably would do is I, I would cut out that section where the, the trunk is leaning, the central leader is leaning, and I might reestablish a new, a new leader using one of the side branches and pulling it up into an upright position. Um, that would be one way that you could deal with it. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, we have a real treat for you as we take a tour of a beautiful pollinator garden. We recently visited the Isaacs home in southeast Nebraska to see some gorgeous prairie native flowers and grasses, and some were planted, a lot were volunteers, but it's all beautiful and a great tribute to pollinators. Let's take a look. Basically, the wife and I moved here in uh, late 04, and literally, there was nothing here. There were no shrubs, no flowers, and so in 05, we said, hey, we need to be doing some things. And so, uh, originally, we started out, uh, I dug 20 holes for the wife, who bought 20 shrubs and flowers and grasses, and said, okay, I'm done. Well, the next year I had to rearrange all those 20 holes and now it's probably 200 holes later and it seems like now we're at a stage where if we need something, we have volunteers of whatever we have planted. And so we don't have to go out and buy anything anymore. We can just say, hey, let's, let's move this to wherever. And that's worked out real well. Uh, the purpose of, of whether it be a flower, uh, whether it be a shrub, whether it be a grass, is to, shall we say, give pollinators something, give birds and animals berries to eat off the shrubs, etc. Uh, give some protection to wildlife in the wintertime. Uh, we've got such a variety of, I mean, we have aronia berries, uh, we have raspberries, blackberries, uh, elderberries, uh, which don't last very long right now. And this has been a real strange year because many, many times we're out working in, in the flower garden, whether it be weeding or whatever, and literally everything's alive around you. And this year, uh, I don't know if it's the winter or because it's so hot, uh, or what, but we're not seeing the pollinators. And I, so I hope this is a temporary thing. Uh, but yeah, if, if we were out here in the garden right now, normally I would expect to see butterflies and bees and all kinds of things. And you'll see a few, but not like we've seen in the past. Um, but uh, this is just something that uh, we, we try to work pretty hard on. Again, my wife is the primary worker on all this, and uh, I think she's done a, a pretty good job of combining flowers and, and grasses and, and et cetera.
uh, we, we try to have something that's booming in the spring, uh, like coneflowers, for instance, uh, and then something uh, maybe more midsummer, and then fall. And right now, you are kind of seeing the pre-fall uh, scenario here. Uh, we, we see some things beginning to bloom, but yet here in a few more weeks, this is just going to be crazy with color. Uh, what you saw along the ditches and along the fence line, that is an area that every spring we burn. And as you can see, it comes back just full force. The flower gardens that you've seen, we literally cut that down every spring and we shred it or try to shred it and use that as mulch right back on the flower gardens. So we're benefiting all the way around. Thank you so much to Deb and Howard for inviting us to see their home and that really incredible prairie planting. They're doing everything right, and it's worth it. All right, Kyle, uh, you have a lot of good guys, bad guys here. Your okay. first one is from Omaha. Pretty cool picture. What is that? Um, these are uh, just stink bug uh, hatchlings. I, I think a lot of the stink bugs look very similar just after they hatch. I think these are probably brown marmorated stink bugs though. Mm -hmm. So these are an invasive, um, so they would be one of the bad guys and I'd, I'd try to get rid of them. Definitely not one of the beneficial predatory ones, I'm pretty sure on that. All right, uh, your next two pictures come to us from Carroll, Nebraska. And this is um, an insect she's never seen before. Yeah, it's another stink bug nymph, um, a little bit older this one. It. I, I suspect this is probably um, Eushistus species, which that would be like the brown stink bug um, or one spotted stink bug, which those are um, amongst the most common. Um, that's likely what it is. So an, again, another one that you know is a pest of, of various um, fruits, crops, whatever, but not really a, a big concern. All right, um, your third one comes to us from Blair. What's this? Uh, this one is is a good guy. This is um, uh, an American um, carrion beetle. So these, the larvae, um, they're decomposers. They, they feed on dead animals and help recycle that. Um, and the adults, uh, they actually will feed on some carrion too, but kind of another nice thing that they do is they'll, they'll also feed on uh, maggots, the, the fly mm -hmm. larvae in that carrion. So they kind of help control those fly numbers as well. Cool, and your final one is an Omaha viewer. What's this? Yeah, it's a, an ivory marked longhorn beetle. Um, I, I'm very um, partial to, to longhorn beetles, so I will call it a good guy. Um, but it, it's definitely not one that's like gonna hurt anything. They bore into um, the, the heartwood of numerous different uh, hardwood trees, but not anything that's gonna really be a concern to any of those any of those landscape trees. All right, thank you, Kyle. Dennis, yours is holes in the ground night. Okay. <laughs> the first one here, uh, this is a carny viewer, four inch mound of soil in the center of the yard. The hole is the size of a pencil, has never seen anything around it, had a similar one in a flower garden and had a plant die. Okay, well, so what this looks like after it got rained on is, is that it's a mound from a mole. Hmm. that's pushing it up with its head as it goes deeper. And that small hole is an insect or a worm that's taking advantage of the soft soil. All right. Okay. So look for That's the best I can do by, from this photograph. All right. Your next one is a wahoo. Uh, yeah. And set out a live trap but didn't catch anything. Okay. So first of all, you can't set out a live trap until you know what you're going to catch because what are you going to bait for, right? So instead of putting out a live trap first, put out a camera trap first. Then you can see what you have and then take it from there on how to get rid of it. As big as these holes look like, it looks like something you like a skunk, but it looks awful big for skunk. It could be a badger going after ground squirrels. Mm. So as the way they're clawed and the size of them, of course, there's not a good scale here. I'm thinking these are almost six to eight inches mm -hmm. in diameter. I'm gonna go with a badger looking for ground squirrels or moles. All right, so get that camera out. Yeah, get the camera out. All right. It, yeah, it doesn't look like a fox and it doesn't yeah. look like a, um, yeah, or a coyote. 
That looks, the way that is dug, it looks more like a badger is digging. All right, and your next two are a Fairberry viewer. This covers a 10 by 10 foot area of the lawn. The holes are so deep that a water hose couldn't fill them. The insects were roly polies, crickets, etc., and it's killed the turf. Okay, so these are voles. Mm. And I'm not sure the voles killed the turf. I think something else might have killed the turf and the voles took advantage of it. Um, voles are granivores. They're gonna eat seed. They're not gonna really go after roots or anything like that. Um, but they might have caused the air to go down there and dry up um, the roots of the grass. But those are voles. And they have great systems, so if there's a lot of rain, they don't get flooded. So water is not gonna help. If anything, you, it may flood your basement before it's going to have <laughs> do something to the voles. The voles can, they live through floods. They know how to do it. All right, so one of those multi-catch traps. Yeah, one of the multi-catch box traps will be the way to go. All right, thank you, Dennis. All right, uh, Sarah, you have uh, a Wayne, Nebraska viewer who sent in a, um, this particular picture. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what the tree was and certainly didn't know what this is. And, and yes, it belongs on the other end of the table, but Kyle's plate was full. That's all right. <laughs> this is an ash tree and this is uh, ash flower gall, which is caused by mites that feed on the male flowers in the springtime. So we see these very commonly on ash trees. Doesn't really hurt the tree. It does make the tree look a little ugly, <laughs> but uh, ultimately you can just ignore it. Nothing you need to do. All right. Uh, your next one is a Giltner, Nebraska viewer. And she's, <clears throat> excuse me, wondering uh, what this is that came up. And is this a, plant, a, pl a good plant or a weedy plant? This is one you probably want to get rid of. Um, this is one of the uh, more invasive honeysuckles, Amir honeysuckle, um, which is an ex kind of an escaped ornamental. So I would probably take this one out. All right. And your final one is an Omaha viewer. And she's on year two with this particular cone flower. She wonders, is this the beginning of aster yellows or is this fasciation? This is fasciation. If it was aster yellows, those leaf or those flower petals would probably still be green or they would be an odd color instead of the normal kind of coral color that you would see on these flowers. So this is not a disease. It's just an, an odd mute, uh, cell mutation in the flower itself. So just enjoy it. Enjoy it. You don't have to worry about it affecting the rest of the flowers or the rest of the plants in the future. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Well, we are really proud of our garden this year. It's been some weird weather. All of our plants are still looking great. So here's Terry James out at the Backyard Farmer Garden to tell us more. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're continuing to harvest our vegetables. We are up to 167 pounds for the month of July. 100 of that, remember, was our potatoes, but our peppers, tomatoes, and squash are about ready to be harvested. So we're gonna be really bumping up those numbers for our, our donations to the food bank here in the East Campus area. We're also seeing some fantastic foliage colors in a lot of our annual flowers that are in the backyard farmer garden. So it's really adding to that look. We're also beginning to start examining what went well this year, what didn't go well this year, and taking the notes to figure out what we're gonna want to start next year or what we want, may want to change up. Remember to stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden for our last East Campus Discovery Day tour. We'll be here and we'll be able to answer all of your questions. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. Right now it is time for the lightning round. All right, Sarah, okay. you're up. I'm ready. We have a viewer who has a 20 year old maple that gets leaf scorch every year and he wants to know whether watering with a deep root waterer will help alleviate that. No, water from the surface because if you put that deep root waterer in you're gonna miss a bunch of roots that are at the surface so don't use a deep root water. All right, uh, we have a second viewer who wants to know why her calibrachoa stopped flowering in July. Calibrachoa like cooler temperatures, so it's pretty common for them to, to ease off on the flowering in the, in the heat of the middle summer, but they'll come back as temperatures cool in the fall. All right, we have a Murdoch viewer who has a very healthy Rose of Sharon plant, but no flowers. What happened there? Hmm, boy, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm stumped on that one. All right, an Ashland viewer says her zucchini gets three to four inches long, turns yellow and croaks. 
Any ideas? Okay, so my first thought is water management. We do see blossom end rot on, on zucchini. Um, so make sure that you're keeping your plants nice and evenly moist, that they're not getting really dry, and then you're watering them a lot, and that, that might help. Otherwise, it, it could be um, heat pollination issues related to the fruits not setting well. All right, nice job, Sarah. Okay, Dennis, you ready? Yep. <laughs> Always ready. We had actually three people send us this question. Okay. So squirrels are knocking their tomatoes to the ground and taking one bite. How mm -hmm. can they uh, stop them from doing that? You have to put a cage around it. It's the only thing. All right. We have a question about characteristics of plants that deer will not eat. We do have a list in, as a neb guide or in our wildlife thing. It's no particular characteristics. It's kind of here and there. And there's very few. All right. We have a viewer who wants you to repeat where your wildlife app is so that they sure. wildlife.unl.edu. All right. Real simple. <laughs> we have uh, a viewer who wants to know, they used grub control and poison pellets for mole control and it didn't work. Why not? Because they don't eat grubs, they eat earthworms, and it's, if it's not one of those gummy worm or gummy grubs, it's not going to kill them. All right. A red cloud viewer wants to know what kind of snakes would be in and out of the cattails near the shore of a spring-fed freshwater pond. Probably our water snake, Neurodia sipton. All right. Nice job. Okay, Kyle. First one here is a homeowner wants to, and this is a Lincoln viewer, they want to know whether a homeowner can actually do the soil drench imidacloprid for a magn for the magnolia scale or whether they have to get a, a professional to do it. No, you, you can do that. All right. This is a Carney viewer who used ortho home defense for insects on carpenter ants in a catalpa. Was that the right choice? Uh, for carpenter ants, probably not. Um, it, you would, yeah, those are going to require a lot more. All right. We have a Nyabrera viewer who got bitten by an insect that caused these huge bites that look like somebody burned her with the end of a cigar. Um, people can react differently to insect bites, so it's hard to say. Um, if it was a real big reaction, maybe like a horsefly or... or something like that, deer fly. All right, so if the base of a zucchini plant is sawed off and all mushy, what insect would have done that? Um, that sounds like squash vine borer. Okay, painted ladies, pollinators, and the butterflies, where are they this year? Um, don't know, we haven't been seeing very many painted ladies. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I know it, it's crazy, we, we love them. <laughs> all right, Sarah, plants of the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a, a nice native grass, uh, or a, an improved variety of a native grass, and then we have a, a, a beautiful little perennial down here. So the little white flowers are a type of baby's breath. This is Oldham's baby's breath. And um, it's, a, it's an easy one to grow, very adaptable to moisture, various moisture and soil conditions. Um, dries very well, so um, it's, a, it's a, a beautiful one to, to have in the garden, especially for flower arrangements and things like that. Um, and obviously blooming right now, blooming in August and September. So Oldham's Baby's Breath is the little white flowers. The, the grass that we have here is a type of blue grama called Blonde Ambition. And um, it's been in the nursery trade for quite a few years now. It gets to be about 24 to 36 inches tall, and you'll have these, you know, these pretty seed heads kind of floating there above the, the rest of the uh, plant itself. Um, likes well-drained soil. Um, does the best in full sun, but will go to a little bit of shade, um, but really best in full sun. So um, another, uh, a great grass to try in, a, in our landscapes that would be indicative of our, our grassland state. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. And of course, those came out of the backyard farmer garden. Mm -hmm. All right, Kyle, we have uh, also still some friend and foe here. This is from a Lincoln viewer, your very first one, uh, taken in the front yard where sedum salvia and purple coneflower live. Full disclosure, th she thinks she, f she carried this from one side of the yard to the other. Okay. What is this and what do you do about it? Well, it's, it's a slug. Um, you can get some of uh, Dennis's snakes for, <laughs> for it. Um, they, they really like um, 
they like shaded areas, uh, plants in shaded areas, and, and a lot of moisture. So, you know, sometimes, as long as they're not a real big problem, trying to sort of control those things, um, you know, making sure there's not excessive mo moisture or too much mulch, that can kind of help reduce the numbers. Um, there are some baits available for them, I think iron phosphate, but if, if they're not a big problem, probably don't need to worry about that. All right, uh, your next one comes to us from Paxton, Nebraska, and they call this a slug looking insect. Uh, they're on the leaves of the cherry trees. Yeah, this is a pear slug sawfly. Um, and unlike the last one that, that was a slug, this one is actually not a slug. It's, um, it's actually the, the larva of a, um, uh, of a wasp, excuse me. So these, um, they do like cherry. That's one of the prefer, preferred hosts. And there's a couple of generations, one um, in July, one in September. That second generation is usually the bigger problem. Um, but fortunately, because it's late enough in the year, it doesn't usually, you know, it doesn't usually really hurt too much. Um, these I, I would usually, you know, recommend just starting off with um, controlling them with a forceful um, stream of water, trying to dislodge those, knock them off. That should do a pretty good job for the most part. Um, otherwise, you could you could treat with like spinosad, um, but you just want to make sure you're following the post-harvest interval for that. All right, uh, you have two pictures on this next one, and uh, she she wonders what this is. She found it in central North Omaha. Yeah, this is a really, um, really unique caterpillar. Um, it's the, the caterpillar for a, a noctuid moth, and it has a cool name. It's called the Wedgling. Um, <laughs> and it, it's diagnostic, you know, because of that really swollen thorax and abdomen. Um, but it's not really a pest of anything. They, they feed on a weed, uh, wood sorrel, so nothing to... No big deal on yep. that one. All right, now we had this next one come in both from North Platte and from La Vista. Something is destroying the petunias. One day they're beautiful, the next day they're not. She saw a green caterpillar, which of yeah. course is right there turning purple. What is this? Yeah, um, probably tobacco budworm. Mm -hmm. this, I've been, been getting a number of these uh, lately. It's that time of year. So uh, they, they do like um, petunias. They, you know, they'll, they'll hide out during the day at the base of the plants and then come up at night. And so that's why those flowers look like they're sort of disappearing overnight, but you're not seeing anything. So if you go out with a flashlight um, in the evening, a lot of times you'll be able to find them. Um, if it's in a small, you know, small potted plants, um, you can oftentimes just hand pick those and destroy them. Um, otherwise, you can use um, something like, like per, uh, permethrin for for controlling those if it's a little bit larger area and hand picking isn't, isn't really an option. All right, thank you, Kyle. All right, still more holes, Dennis. Okay. <laughs> this one is in Lincoln. Uh, several holes in the yard, no hill mounds, inch and a half in diameter, straight down six inches, then horizontally, same thing, trying to get water through those. What do we think is happening here? Yeah, if they put water down there and it doesn't seem to go anywhere, it's probably a vole. All right. uh, if it was a ground squirrel, the water would come up 20 foot later because they, they have a simple system, but the vole has a very elaborate system. Because of that, use the box traps. Mm -hmm. Do not use gaseous chemicals because their system sometimes goes up against the foundation. In the last couple of years, um, people have had that gas leak into their basement and kill pets and children. So oh stay away from the gaseous chemicals if you're within 50 foot of a, a dwelling. Oh my goodness, yeah. good, good advice there. Yeah. All right, your next one comes to us from Juanita. And uh, we've got this hole, about a dozen scattered around the farmstead, a mm. foot long, eight inches wide. You can see a foot into the hole. They're not close to each other, and they're about 50 feet apart. Yeah, I, I like one. It's a good place out there in Hayes County? Or uh, Hayes Dundee. County? Oh, Dundee. Okay, mm -hmm. I knew it was close. It's near Ender's Reservoir. Okay, I'm trying to think. I would have to go with almost a coyote. Really? Yeah. Okay. Or something, or it could be a fox, gray fox going after something. It just doesn't, I, yeah, it's hard to tell. I can't see any paw prints, but. A, about a dozen of them scattered around the front. Yeah, side. but it could be, it's after something that's underground. Like a, there's a lot of pocket gophers out there. Okay. And it could be something like a fox after the pocket gophers or a, a coyote after the pocket gophers. All right. Your next one is uh, Elkhorn, 
on purpose because we know this doesn't belong to you. What is yeah. this? This looks like it's probably an insect mm -hmm. digging. Um, it could be a cicada killer. It's not as indicative as some cicada killer holes. So it could be a wasp, mm -hmm. a different type of wasp, or even a spider. But the way it's granular and you don't see the paw marks, it's definitely an insect carrying that out. All right, and your final one comes to us from Norfolk. Same thing, okay. fresh dirt appeared in the morning, never had anything like this That's before. definitely a cicada killing wasp. All right. I can tell by the, the formation there. Again, granular, so that's a wasp. Okay, all right. Sarah, your turn. Um, the, again, some of these fell to you because we don't have pathology tonight. Okay. Uh, what is happening to the tomatoes? So this is classic blossom end rot, mm -hmm. and it's caused by a calcium deficiency that occurs when these little tomatoes were first forming. And it's not because the plants don't have enough calcium. So don't buy the, buy the blossom end rot stopper products at nurseries and garden centers and spray them on the plants because calcium does not move through the foliage well. It has to come up from the root system. Typically this is caused by a watering issue because water or calcium is not particularly water soluble. So the plants have to have a lot of water to be able to move it well. So make sure that your plants are nice and evenly watered throughout the season. Um, and that usually will help. Mulch also helps because it helps hold in soil moisture. Sometimes we see this on the first tomatoes of the year because um, the plants are young when these tomatoes set on and the roots were not functioning at peak efficiency. If that's the case, just pick them off and hopefully the next flush will be free of this and you won't see it again. All right, uh, your next one took a picture of an odd tomato. Yeah. What is this? So I've had this happen sometimes in my kitchen <laughs> if I've left a tomato sitting on the counter too long but the seeds are sprouting inside the tomato. They're actually germinating and starting to grow. <laughs> and it looks really weird because you've got all these little pointed things starting to pierce the skin of the tomato. The, the technical name for this is vivipary, mm -hmm. but the seeds are germinating. All right. Your next one is a Norfolk viewer. Uh, this is a brandy wine tomato with these little white specks on it. Yeah, this looks like bacterial speck, mm -hmm. um, which is a very common disease we see in garden tomatoes. It's, it's unusual, most of the diseases we see in tomatoes are fungal uh, in origin, but this is actually a bacterial disease. And you'll probably also see little black specks on the foliage as well. So you could spray the plants with a copper fungicide to protect the new growth and the new setting tomatoes and hopefully that would help it um, go away. All right, and your next two pictures are a viewer who's very happy that she can now grow squash, Hubbard's uh, in particular, but she's wondering, um, Harvest is 100 to 120 days before first frost or something like that. They planted in the middle of May and then she's also heard that you should follow the vines and pluck off anything that's really small right now because they won't have time to mature. Well, I mean, you could take off the fruits if you wanted to, but I would leave the foliage because the foliage is the engine for the plant to you know, do the photosynthesis and the carbohydrate development to make those fruits enlarge properly. Um, as far as when to harvest, you know, typically with the winter squash like that, when the outer rind gets hard enough that you have a trouble pushing your thumbnail into it, that skin gets kind of thick and tough, then usually that's a good indication that you're getting close to harvest. All right, excellent. That was quite a plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, for many of us, our harvest is already underway, but you'll need to keep in mind that you can still get a fall garden going for more produ produce later in the season. Terry James returns to us to tell us what we need to know for a fall garden. It's that time of year again, we're all getting super busy with kids going back to school, sports, getting ready for all of that. It's just taking a lot of time out and we may not be spending so, as much time in our garden. We're also getting kind of frustrated with our garden where we're seeing lots of diseases and our plants are kind of dying. And we're dealing with all those critters and insects that are just ruining our squash and our tomatoes and all that stuff. But fear not, actually now is the best time to get back into our garden and start a fall garden. Many of us don't think about starting a garden in the fall, but this is really one of the best times to do it. I know you've got a lot of those spring seeds that are sitting around, so why not go find those and we'll get started thinking about a fall garden. One of the best things about fall gardening is that 
everything is optimum. So our soils are warm, so those seeds are going to begin germinating quickly. The temperatures are starting to moderate, so we're not really seeing those big temperature swings like we see often in the spring. We have much more light in the fall than we do in the spring because we're not usually as cloudy and the sun is at a higher angle. And those insects that we are usually dealing with that are bothering us now are pretty much all gone. So one of the tips that you need to know is kind of what can you start this time of year and how do you figure that out? The first thing you need to do is go find those spring seeds that you planted in March and April and flip them back and see how many days to harvest there are. Then what you do is you go to your calendar and you go back and figure out when your last frost date is. Here in Lincoln, it's October 10th. So what we did was we counted back and figured out how many days it is. Then we looked at the back of the seed packet and figured out how many days of harvest. So we sorted through them and we found a whole bunch of seeds that we're gonna be able to start. We have some peas, we have some green beans, we have some summer squash, some zucchini. So all of those are going into our garden and we're gonna have plenty of time to get those harvested. One other thing that you need to think about though is to add a couple extra days onto the end of that harvest time, just so that you make sure that that fruit is ripe. Especially for those viewers out west where your frost date is a little earlier, closer to the end of September. If you choose that you don't want to start any of those fall veggies, another thing that you really need to start thinking about for the fall garden is what went well, what didn't go well. Keep a note. What did you like? What tasted good? What harvested well? and what gave you the enjoyment of your garden. So what flowers looked fantastic and what would you like to change? Another thing is that there are a lot of new gardeners out there. Did you succeed? Do you wanna make your garden a little bit bigger? Now is the best time to do that too. And if you really wanna try something new and you haven't done it before, go and grab some seed to start a cover crop. Oats are a really good one for the fall or you can find some alfalfas or some clovers and those kind of things. Spread that over, get those started, and they'll protect your soil all winter long. So as that harvest is completed, you will need to make room for those new plantings. And as Terry said, the conditions can be much more agreeable second time around. All right, we'll look forward to that. We have a ra rapid fire here, Kyle. First one here is the beetle on the garden on a green bean plant. What is this? It's a grapevine beetle. Okay, bad guy. Um, next one, large shiny beetle on the front step and then found this one on the wall. What is this one? Um, this is a, a leaf-footed bug and it looks like it has a tachinid egg on it. Okay, a leaf-footed bug, that's yep. fun. Um, the next one here is what kind of worm and it did this to the tomatoes. What, what do we have here? Yeah, this one I'm really curious about. Um, so the second one, I, I, it's definitely uh, an army worm. I think it's maybe a yellow striped army worm, but it's hard, hard to say from the picture. The first image, I wasn't sure if there, if there is a caterpillar inside of that tomato or not, um, in which case there, there might be two, two different caterpillars mm -hmm. going on here. Um, the yellow striped army worms will feed on tomatoes. They, they tend to feed on the foliage more not as much on the fruit, though they can, um, but uh, tomato fruit worms or corn ear worms, they will uh, develop completely inside of the, the fruit there. So that could be, if there was something inside there, that might be what's going on. You might have two different caterpillars there and um, you could use uh, pyrethroids for, to control both of those. Yeah, nothing more gross than to cut open a tomato and discover that. Whew, all right. Uh, Dennis, your first two here are um, a Columbus viewer. She found six dead snakes all in different locations. Two were trying to go back down into a hole, but they were dead. She doesn't use anything different on her yard. That, I mean, nothing that she yeah. hasn't used before. Um, so. Of course, it's hard to say why they die from the picture. I don't see any green spots, so it's not starvation. I don't see any injuries. But you never, it could be something like toxic water. Mm. Um, lots of times when we have real hot weather, 
people use tap water and it starts to evaporate and they can't drink anything so they go for the tap water and the fluorines and chloramines in there can be toxic mm -hmm. in high numbers. Mm -hmm. um, so they need rainwater. Uh, again, um, I would need to do a necropsy to, to even start to decide why. But they're common garter, not common, they're plains garter snakes, excuse me, they're plains garter snakes. Yeah, so you want the dead snakes in a box? Frozen. <laughs> Preferably. Right away, frozen. <laughs> right. You can't do anything if it starts to rot. <laughs> Your next two pictures are um, snails, actually. Yeah. So oh. there's a dime and there's a snail. We'll get the brown snake out. Just dinner. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so these are just land snails yeah. found throughout, you know, wooded areas of Nebraska. Are they damaging to? Probably to a hosta or some plants. They're not damaging anything else. I mean, right. they're good food for a brown snake. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank you, Dennis. Sarah, uh, you have three pictures on this first one. This is an Edgar, Nebraska viewer. Uh, great big pin oak was hit by lightning last week. They're wondering if it's going to be okay or will they need to remove it and uh, how soon should they do that? So since we're only looking at pictures of the trunk, it's hard to say what other damage might have been occurred or might have occurred up in the canopy. But from the trunk perspective, I think I would recommend that you probably wait until next spring to see how this tree leaves out and if you have any branches that are dead and, and those types of things. How the tree performs from this point out depends on how much of that bark has died. And it can be quite variable with lightning strikes on a tree, depending on a lot of different factors. And so there's no real way for us to tell. Now, in this picture, obviously, you can see a lot of bark was immediately blasted off that side of the trunk. And there's a good, a good possibility that there's a good section of dead bark on the sides of that area where the bark has come away. But exactly how much, there's no way to say. So... You could just wait and see, just give the tree until next spring, see how it leaves out, how many dead branches you have, um, and then make a decision at that point. Right, that's really unfortunate. Definitely, All yeah. Right. And usually it hits the tallest tree in the area, <laughs> and <course>. so. <laughs> Down it goes, Yeah, I know it. All right, you have one more picture, Sarah. This one comes to us from Norfolk. Uh, it's one of the ornamental pears, and half the tree is yellow, and, it's, and, and he says it's been going on for about three years now. The tree is about 15 years old. So one thing that comes to mind for me here is looking at this picture, you can see that the turf is in really good condition. It's, it's pretty dark green. It looks like it's really healthy. It makes me think that there could be a, a, a chlorosis situation going on here based on high pH soil and a highly watered turf. Um, I... You know, we in eastern Nebraska and the Norfolk area, we typically do have pretty alkaline soil. Sometimes we also have fairly alkaline water. And if they're watering the turf quite a lot to keep it alive, they, they could be actually exacerbating the situation for the tree, making, this, making the conditions more alkaline. Um, plus, if they're watering the turf a lot, um, you can end up with a, a, a oxygen deficient area of soil at the, the um the top of the soil surface where it's just completely filled with water. And that can make the roots not function very well either, which can also contribute to additional chlorosis problems. So I guess I would need a lot more information to figure out exactly what's going on with this tree. But I'm wondering if maybe we, there could just be some adjustment with the water uh, to back off a little bit, to moderate the needs of the tree and the turf and maybe help this yellowing go away a little bit. Mm -hmm.